before I kind of talk about the reweapon little old moss, I think it's always a wise idea to kind of look at where the site is geographically, um, kind of within the Greater Manchester region. Uh, so this first slide just represents that really, just shows Greater Manchester and the kind of urbanised areas, which are these kind of blue areas. Uh, and then the relevant mosslin sites within Greater Manchester wetlands, as it were. So just to the north and near Bolton, we've got Red Moss Triple SI. Uh, that's right next to the Macron Stadium. Uh, very, very isolated, but a decent large fragment of fairly, fairly good bog, to be fair. Um, and of course, we've got the Chat Moss Remnants, which makes up kind of, you know, around Astley Moss and the new SBI just south of there. Little Walden Moss and Caddyshead Moss are essentially the same kind of peak mass there. And then you move a little bit further south to Holcroft Moss, just over the 62, and down into Warrington to Risley Moss. And again, we've got another little outlier uh, to the west called Highfield Moss Trip. Slightly different site. Um, it's over by Wigan Council and it's a, it's a, it's a mire actually, as opposed to a lowland bog. Uh, so it's got some added nutrients from another lowland source, essentially. Okay, next slide. So, what exactly is a peat bog? Um, beautiful looking scene there. I think it might be a blanket bog up in Scotland, to be fair. But what is it? I mean, at the end of the day, it's, well, it's peat, isn't it? It's sphagnum moss, it's vegetation, it's all decaying matter. Um, and of course, we know that they're highly specialized habitat with an equally highly specialized species associated with them. And we also know that um, they're extremely rare now. Um, the percentage always gets knocked about seems to be 2%, but it changes all the time. Some people say three, some people say four, 2% seems to be a fairly good given. Um, and we're very fortunate to have a, a fragment of lowland bog within our immediate area. Um, now these highly specialized plants uh, are things like sundews and things like sphagnum. In fact, if we go to the next slide, we can take a few, a look at a few pictures of these actually. There we go, classic kind of species that we've got across um, well, all of our sites in some way, shape or form, uh, especially sphagnum like Magellanicum, which is a key indicator of what you'd call a, a bog in a, a healthy kind of condition. Golden bog must be a little nice site of wind marley, only recently uh, discovered. And of course, your classic kind of species like hairstyle cotton grass and common cotton grass. Without those, uh, you just won't get the sphagnum colonization as it provides a bit of a kind of nursery, if you like, uh, for the sphagnum to colonize and grow and get a bit of protection from the wind and the sun. Otherwise, it desiccates very, very quickly. Species which uh, you kind of have to start reintroducing a little bit more, like bog cranberry and across the teeth, and particularly round leaf sundew. Um, sundews are, are quite amazing, really. When they go dormant, you won't even recognize them. But um, we have them across Little Walden and Caddishead. Um, fairly easy to propagate, strangely enough. Uh, you can just cut the head off uh, of, of, uh, of an individual and, and place it in some peat. As long as you keep it fairly damp and wet, it'll just uh, re-sprout whole new growth, which is quite incredible. Okay, so what else do we have? Uh, apart from those, yes, we have some of our fauna as well. Uh, these, this is just a little snapshot of some of the, the more specialized species or rarer species that we get on the moss. Uh, things like large butterfly, of course, um, recently we introduced to Astley moss um, from a previous survey, I think two weeks ago, there were 14 flights um, noted. Not necessarily 14 individuals, but 14 flights across the survey transect. So as of today, it's a fairly successful reintroduction as things go. Well. Of course, this isn't about the end, uh, but it's very encouraging for the first year to know that the individuals that were taken from Chester Zoo and put on site last spring survived successfully bred and then the egg survived and etc the pupae survived and they, they've all emerged or some have emerged at least it's always worth you of noting brown hairs as a, as a uk bat species a priority species and uh, suffering from fragmentation across the landscape um, is a little bit of a stronghold we often see them on nasty moss and little water moss alike and they do cling on uh, within the area and you got other things that might not come across so often lattice heath moss particularly rare common heath moth not so rare, but still a beautiful thing. And the bog bush cricket as well, um, sort of rare in, in, in a non sciencey way. Um, it exists on Little Walden and on Caddishead, but like I say, they are essentially one and the same. And it also exists on Pest Furlong Moss in Warrington, which is a tiny little fragment of rewet bog um, just in Birchwood area. And on Holcroft Moss. Um, now, the reason why it probably doesn't exist on other peatlands, say Astley Moss, for example, is through historic burning, is what we think. It's a cricket, oh, it's, a, it's a bush cricket to be specific. Um, and it does have wings, but yet it is flightless. It's a, it's a sedentary species. Uh, might be a bit misleading, you know, sedentary suggests it doesn't move much, but just because it doesn't fly doesn't mean it moves much. But if, it, if a site was historically burned, uh, it most likely would have annihilated the species, uh, given the fact that it couldn't just simply fly away. 
Uh, so noticeably absent from, from some of our better triple SIs, and we're looking at reintroducing that to some of them, but it is a long process because this particular species has a, a biannual life cycle. So it layers eggs one year, they'll remain for two years until they emerge essentially. So a long time to go before we see much traction with that at the minute. Um, we'll just highlight just how specialised these uh, these mussel habitats are, that you get these species up, you don't even know they're there in until one day. You kind of just come across them, you think, hmm, incredible. Um, so yeah, those are just a few of the kind of bits and bobs that you kind of get on the mosslins. And of course, the classic stuff is, why do we need them? I think we're all fairly in the know about this kind of stuff, but you know, they provide a, a vital kind of natural capital solution is, is the kind of catchphrase, isn't it, at the minute? Um, so not only do they provide a habitat for endangered and specialised species, they also serve a tangible purpose for us. Um, things like a carbon store. I mean, admittedly, only in a recovering or a good condition is it a carbon store. Um, but we can get them to that point, thankfully. And of course, there's a flood mitigator. Um, Sphagnum moss holds 20 times its own weight in water. So once you've got that carpet of sphagnum, you'll be uh, holding a lot more water, a lot more rainwater specifically, and also helping to filter that water as well. And with that increased hydrology, you see a decreased wildfire risk. Of course, we're all well aware of the kind of wildfire risks that we've been seeing over the last few years. Um, and a little water, we've had our own fires in the last two and three years. Um, but I gotta say, each and every one of them has never really, fingers crossed, uh, taken off. It's always been a surface burn and you can actually follow the line of the fire as to where it's getting to the much wetter points and having to retreat and find another way around. So it is a, it's, although it's an awful thing to happen, it does highlight how important the wetting these bogs are because uh, it does actually work. Um, so yes, we do talk about natural capital quite often these days. Um, I think you know personally it's very difficult to put a, a figure on all these kind of uh, these values. Um, something that is missing from there is, is a recreational value, uh, something that's often forgotten. You know, we need people to come and enjoy uh, these natural spaces because without people enjoying them, they don't get, get a connection, they don't care. And without that level of care at a local level, you, you're you kind of failing in a sense. And if you're failing on that way, if it does become threatened in a particular way, it's difficult to get um, kind of public support to stop anything potentially damaging happening. So a very important part of that is the recreational side of things. That's something that we're working on Little Water Moss. We've uh, just recently secured funding to complete the path around the perimeter, which would make access a lot easier. And we're looking at potentially installing a few like uh, little bird screens as well. We did have a bird hide once, but it got burned down. Um, that was a long time ago now. But since we're getting some interesting species coming along now, and it seems to be uh, settling. It's, it seems like a good idea now. To start managing it more as a, as a nature reserve, as opposed for like a wildlife refuge, if you like. All right, next slide, I think, Marge. Ah, okay, restoration works, yeah. Um, I don't know why I've got a slide just saying restoration works, but I think the next part is uh, talking about how we're gonna, well, how we have been restoring little water moss over the last nine years or so. Uh, so we can go to the next slide, cheers. There you go, some fun facts on the screen there. Um, that is actually a picture of little water moss, uh, unbelievably, I still can't quite believe it myself. Um, as you can see, huge, massive drainage ditch running that would be east to west on the site, kind of um, just a touch further from the centre, I think. Um, and it's a barren, flat, oxidising wasteland. Um, and of course, that was drained to be farmed or to be milled for peat, essentially. Um, milling, peat, milling for peat is an awful thing. It was a very strange um, thing being able to watch. Uh, milling of peat going on on the west side of the site while you're trying to restore the east side of the site is a very strange juxtaposition, I must admit. I'm very happy that it's ended. Um, at the time, we didn't have a choice. Uh, there was still a contract in place when we bought the site in 2013, and so it had to run its way. Uh, Leslie, are the RSPB involved? No, the RSPB are not involved in any way in this particular uh, site. Um, we don't tend to do too much. Well, we do have an RSP representative on the call, so I don't know whether she wants to say anything. So. I'm just trying to escape the children. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm just going out oh. into the kitchen. Oh, but sorry, yeah, hi. Uh, I'm definitely not an expert, but Carrington Moss is uh, one of the priority habitats for the RSPB. So, um, 
yeah, I'm really trying to work with Marge, uh, looking at what we can do, because there's only two in Greater Manchester that the RSPB can work on, and Carrington Moss is one of them that we can comment on rather than that's as far as it's got so far. But um, yeah, it's really interesting. Thanks for this, Marge and Andy. I think we've got another question as well. Who do you work with to improve biodiversity? You mentioned Chester Zoo. Yeah, I mean, by the fact of restoring the site from a degraded bog um, to a functioning ecosystem, again, we are restoring biodiversity. You think we've got essentially bare peat to begin with. So we do work with Chester Zoo in terms of our reintroduction projects, specifically the large heath butterfly. Um, they breed them in-house for us because they have the ability and expertise to do that. Um, other than that, it's looking at our suppliers um, who grow uh, our peatland species, our floral species in, in a peat-free medium. Uh, places like Cumbria Wildflowers, for example, or Princess Park Garden Centre in uh, Earlham is a, is a, a social enterprise we work with closely uh, and tend to give the smaller contracts to as often as possible. And then there's micro propagation services who are a massive company in Leicester who deal largely with sphagnum moss, uh, but they also do the other species that I mentioned, common cotton grass, hairstyle cotton grass, uh, bog rosemary, bog cranberry, I think bilberry, heather, that kind of stuff. And they all grow in a peat-free medium, like I say. So we work with them to, to help bring back some, some floral diversity uh, to the sites. Um, and other than that, it's using in-house expertise, really. And looking at um, historical records, of course, as well, because uh, we want to follow proper principles and guidelines, for example, the IUCN guidelines and reintroductions, you know, a reintroduction is exactly that, it's putting back something that was previously there as opposed to an introduction where you're bringing something totally new to a site. And we like to avoid doing that um, because honestly, it's a lot more paperwork and it's a lot harder to do and there's a lot more, there's much more of a, well, it's, it's harder to, to make the case really. When something's previously been there, I think you will be within our rights to try and bring it back. It's worth mentioning as well, a, a guy called Josh Stiles, um, might have seen him knocking around on BBC here and there. Uh, just as uh, works or creates and is the founder of the Northwest Rare Plants Initiative. So when we, you get we've been in contact with Josh, he's he's um, he's been very helpful. Yeah, his his knowledge on floral species generally is is outstanding, uh, and he does a lot of the uh, the growing for the really specialised bog species himself. So he's been reintroducing things like bog asphodel and very successfully as well uh, lesser bladderwort on. Uh, Moss. Um, really quite incredible. I think you brought in a few thousand plants, it's now like 300,000. It's, it's quite mind blowing, really. Um, but I think, again, that's down to knowing the sites and getting them into the right position. Because although a peatland is a peatland, uh, the, the different species that colonize come at different times of restoration and, and apply to different niches. So it's about doing that, that scientific background kind of site survey work prior to doing these kind of reintroductions and this increased floral diversity. Ooh, how much peat was removed? Good gracious. Uh, I actually don't know exactly how much peat was removed. They were meant to, in part of the contract, leave at least a metre across the entire site, um, which in places they haven't. I think it's probably, probably quite a difficult thing to achieve, um, but um, there, there was, there's areas where they've gone right down to the mineral layer. Um, there's areas on site that which haven't been cut commercially recently, and they're about two metres above where it has been cut to. So you could take that as a, as a bit of a, I don't want to say a guess point, but a few years ago, well, a few years, 20, 30, 40 years ago, probably within two meters above where it is now, at least. Then you go back your 10,000 years and you're talking about what, four double decker buses, maybe eight, eight, 10 meters. Um, but they took a lot, you know, it's 107 hectare site and they've been milling it for a fair old time. So a lot went, but not so much that we can't restore it. As I say, meter, meter and a half, you're in a good position. I don't want to put my neck on the line too much, but even if you got less than that, there's still, there's still possibilities. Uh, the main, I think, sticking point for peak depth is it restricts the amount of material you have to play with. Uh, when you're thinking about this restoration works, you want to be putting in bunding networks uh, so you can help retain water and you, have, you haven't got the peat to create those. You haven't got the peat to create them. It's as, it's as simple as that. So you have to get a bit more creative and a bit more uh, frugal with what you do. So it is, it's interesting that actually, Andy, because in, we were just talking just before you joined us because Trafford put a comment in the new Carrington master plan that said that Carrington Moss was effectively too degraded to restore. 
and we don't believe that's true. Uh, I was showing the guys this this book, which is the Greater Manchester Wetlands Survey, mm -hmm. which does mention Carrington Moss in 1995 when this report was done. And I think it was at variable depths, but some of them were quite quite deep. And David or, or Paul might remember more than I do about the peak depth. I think it was about six metres, Marge, up to six metres deep. Uh, it's 325 hectares, wasn't it? 325 hectares in land yeah. area. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. It's incredible. I don't think I don't think many of our sites have six meters depth of peak. To be honest with you, <laughs> yeah, it, it varies a lot across the sites. You know, across the sites, um, so it goes down to about a meter or a meter or a half um, on the outskirts. But, but I think it's one of the largest mosses in the northwest in terms of area. Yeah, three hundred twenty-five hectares. We'll put it right up there. Definitely, yeah. it's incredible. But it's interesting when people talk about. So there's different fundings that funding streams that come about and, and they've started to specify a kind of like a minimum requirement and this is this is applicable to the uplands but there's a peatland code i think john refers to it being a minimum of 50 50 centimeters i think so i mean just don't say it's, it's too degraded to turn back it's going to have to be really really shocking stuff <laughs> you know I mean? yeah we may as well move on to the next slide because we kind of talked about um about that a little bit haven't we and uh there we go that's just a, a picture of, of, of the east side of Little Water Moss looking rather marvellous today. So I've got common cotton grass in there, you've got hair style cotton grass in flower, and you've got sphagnum carpeting all over the place, you've got a little bog pool kind of retaining a bit of groundwater there. And that's the kind of stage we're at on the, on the kind of the better side of the site, so the east side of the site. So it shows that it's wholly possible. I mean, that was, that was taken, I think I took it for this presentation actually, so it'll probably take another last 12 months, that's for sure. And on the east side, just for a bit of uh, context, 4,000 plants were put in to begin with. Uh, nowadays, we're working at, you know, hundreds of thousands of plants. So 4,000 plants, get the hydrology right, give it a few years, I say a few years, you know, nine years, and massive changes happen. Um, it's, it's quite astonishing how quickly that's occurred. And I think if you go to the next slide, Marge, I think we've got a quick bit of drone footage as well to show the site as a bit of a whole. No, I don't. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's the next one. That would make sense, talking about what we've done. So I've already mentioned bonding. Uh, bonding's uh, bread and butter stuff, really. So there's about 14 kilometres on, on Little Walden done in total now, which is astonishing in itself. And generally speaking, these are a metre high, metre wide. You deep down a deep uh, about a metre and, and recompact the peat and build a little raised area over the top of it. A barrier, a wall, a bund. You can call it what you will. It, all it does is um, retain rainwater. Um, you generally build them across the contour lines or where you have a, a sloping edge, so you build it on top of, stop water that way, so it doesn't just run off the back. And uh, then, of course, large scale planting. Uh, unfortunately, because of the fragmentation of the landscape and the degraded state of Little Wolf in particular, you've got to bring back the species through um, whilst we're purchasing them. Uh, there's nowhere else to really get the kind of levels that we're looking at. Now we've got Little Walden, there's potential for us to translocate and harvest our own seed and things like that. But um, again, you, nothing really beats buying in a load of plug plants to get um, massive change in, in a very short amount of time. Um, and again, because we've got sphagnum cover, particularly sphagnum cuspidate is what we see in the background there, the aquatic version of stuff, or aquatic version, aquatic species. Um, we can now translocate that with reckless abandon uh, across site. Um, and that's what we've been doing more recently, try and spread it out. Again, that's another species that once, you, once it's in situ, give it a few years. And it, absolutely just explodes and then standard stuff you know invasive control um you've got your classic uh, examples of that like japanese knotweed and rhododendron but to be honest the the main kind of invasive control we do on on site is is scrub clearance technically not an invasive but silver birch is, is a fantastic colonizer it's a pioneer species and yeah it, it, it can damage the bog essentially picks up rainwater adds some nutrients keeping it simple um uh, as a general rule of thumb, you're looking to keep it below 10% of the whole site. And if we're doing that, we're doing a grand job. So we're all right there. And that is a, a usual thing. Just to mention that David asked a question about whether you'd had to remove any trees for restoration activities. Yeah, I'm afraid we did. Yeah, um, like I say, um, it's, it's just at a later stage in its development, you could probably get away with leaving a few, I think, because there's, there's bogs in Europe which handle pine and birch and willow and stuff like that. And it doesn't take over because I think uh, it's still in a state of restoration, so recovering. 
if you let it go, it would easily turn back and just become something slightly different to a lowland bog, being a weird kind of mix of uh, scrubby, sphagnum kind of wetland. It'd be quite a strange thing. Um, but once you've got it under control, you can then manage the, the 10% essentially. And we do some mitigation planting here and there around the edges because we have um, some willow tits around the border of the site because we've got a nice scrubby silver birch woodland around the perimeter. So some uh, supplementary planting, some mitigation planting to kind of link these areas up. Uh, so it's not all, all cutting them down for fun. And we re re reuse the brash as well. Uh, so as part of the bonding network, you've got a number of pipes, outflow pipes and control pipes. Uh, so we build dead hedges, just semicircles of, of brash around these, and that helps collect sphagnum and let it stop and escape from site. And that also assists in, in sphagnum building up into, into nice dense carcass as well. And that works an absolute treat. So we answer you, that's something we started doing about 18 months ago. Really works. Uh, so else, I, I'm involved with Lindo Moss. Uh, not directly, I know of Lindo Moss. Um, I've, had, um, I've had Poppy Bagwell come out to site as well as um, John as well. I've forgotten his name now, but John came out. And we did a little site visit just to show them what would, what's been achieved a little water moss essentially, just to, to give them a bit of inspiration, I think. Um, but yeah, I'm aware of what's going on there. I know Natural England have been involved and they've put together a plan. And we've got the, uh, who is it as well? Professor at Manchester Met, Simon Kapoor. Simon Kapoor's always out in Little Ward and I know he's involved with Lindo Moss, um, Lindo Moss as well. So I've got high hopes for Lindo Moss. A lot of really intelligent, really experienced people involved there. Uh, so I think it could be a really interesting sign. Um, next slide, I think. Actually, this should be a little video. I should be able to press play on that. This is just a quick bit of drone footage just showing little water. This is from the east side of the site, kind of, well, west side looking east. You can see there's fairly big bodies of water there, which is inevitable. Um, you can't guess everything. He's lost his mind there. Um, but generally speaking, pretty good. We got we had a bit of an issue with that body of water to the to the right side of the screen, if you like, um, because it slightly kind of dips in. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to kind of get a level where you can actually bring in sphagnum moss and colonize effectively. Um, sphagnum cuspidatum likes water, doesn't like too much water. But uh, we've got some plans to bring in some coir logs into that area, uh, which should be really effective, I think, and just help break up that body of water, help prevent the wave action that gets going on there, and again, helps colonize, helps the sphagnum to colonize as well. That bottom right to of the screen, now where it's just paused on, that's uh, where the old bird had used to be. And you kind of see the linear planting that's gone on there if you squint a little bit. But that kind of area next to that track on the right hand side that was planted uh, two years ago yeah, it's almost 100 percent cover really and and that's largely down to this uh, this particular area being laser level so a level was taken of where the water table was uh, kind of within the whole 10 centimeters of the surface and then that area was scraped to meet the same level and it's worked an absolute treat but again a lot of plants went in there at least 50 60 000 total so i can't really stress how important it is to get plants in the ground as soon as humanly possible. That's one of the most important things. You don't want to leave bare feet if it's at all possible. And um, I guess over time, you're going to struggle getting a supply of plants if you can buy 100,000 plants a, a year. All right, I think I've already touched on the next bit, but um, if we go to the next slide. Yeah, species reintro, next slide after that. So species reintroduction project is part of the Greater Manchester Wetlands Partnership. So that's get very confusing after a while. Um, do you plant heather? Yes, David, we do plant heather. Uh, we actually have, as part of the wider site, we've got a, a lowland heath, another UK bat priority species, a uh, priority habitat, not species. Got a bit of wet heath, got a bit of dry heath. Uh, so yeah, we plant heather uh, on there. Um, and we also plant it on areas of the site which are gonna remain a bit drier, just to try and create a bit of that direct connectivity. Um, heather's a good thing. You know, they'll do all right on a bog. Not, not you know, necessarily a perfect bog species, but they, they serve their purpose quite cheap as well. And of course, we've got uh, cross leaved heath, which is a heather as well as part of the Erica family. And that is synonymous with the Manstragos butterfly. Uh, without that, it wouldn't have anything to nectar on. So we've been bringing a lot of that onto the sites to make it suitable for this particular species. It's a marvelous plant, cross leaved heath. Very, very pretty. Lovely pink flower. I feel like most things that flower on a bog seem to be pink. You know, you've got bog cranberry, that's pink, bog rosemary, that's pink. I'll see teeth that's pink. It's really weird. You wouldn't really kind of expect it to hang up, kind of have those kind of colours, but it's, it's quite beautiful. And so anyway, Manstragos butterfly, well in the way, well on the way with the reintroduction of this. Um, 
just need to collect some more from Win Marley this season and give them Chester Zoo again and follow the same protocol we, we followed last year. And hopefully we'll be reintroducing some more. But this is, a, it's, again, it's a long process, even though it's a year on year process and you're seeing development, this is going to be at least a five to 10 year project minimum. Um, you've got to keep on uh, supplementing your, your kind of recipient site population until you can be certain that it's kind of self-sustaining. Uh, so that's going to take an awful lot of time. We've got a couple of people working hard on that, doing PhDs and masters and all sorts with it. So I'm very confident about this so far. Um, the next thing that might be on the list, like I say, is uh, the Bogbush Cricket. So yeah, next slide, Marge, yeah. So the Bogbush Cricket, like I say, I mentioned it's, it's a very slow burn, but it came about, I did, um, did surveys for them way back in like 2018, 19, I think it was. Um, and it was just noticeably absent from sites that uh, are designated triple SIs that are deemed to be in a better condition. So therefore it raises the question as to why, why aren't they there? And as I say, it's probably down to historic burning. There's kind of an interesting species of bog bush cricket because you'd expect from the name that it is uh, a bog specialist. It probably is in the UK, um, but across its range, you'd find it on, on heathland or calcareous grassland, I think around Sweden and, and Germany and stuff like that. So I, you could argue it's a bit of a, not necessarily a specialist, just it's, it's, adapt, it's adapted. It's adapted in the UK to like a bit of a bog because um, I think it provides the right kind of environment for the eggs to survive. As I say, that's a two year biannual kind of life cycle as eggs. So when they lay them, they need them to, to remain quite moist. If they don't do well, to get desiccated quite easily and can dry out. And once that happens, not viable. And you think, well, peat, peat, peat stays pretty wet. Sphagnum is pretty wet, probably does something to do with that. Uh, has anyone estimated, calculated the additional carbon capture that arises from restoring a peat bog? Hmm. Not yet, as I'm aware of. Not nothing that can be um trusted is the wrong word. But there's there's lots of figures getting banded around and lots of calculators coming out at the minute with um the Peatland Gold and Capital Grant Scheme and Biodiversity Net Gain, the all these calculators, and I'm not sure that anyone's really nailed carbon capture just yet. Now there are like I said, there are a few calculators that give you something. Um I think the best one I've come across so far is part of the Peatland Gold, and it will tell you what you're currently kind of emitting and over your kind of restoration trajectory it'll kind of give you insight on to what that might become in terms of will it you know, become a carbon sink and, and what we'd be doing up from years five through to 50. Um, that, Andrew, do you have a link to that at all? To that kind I of have link? a copy of it yeah I can send yeah. it over. Could you that'd be useful I think thank you. Yeah it's a very hard thing to do um I think there's just information that just isn't available to do it super effectively. It's going to be quite broad strokes, you know, as I'm sure you can imagine if you're looking at peatland, uh, you can't just simply look at it from a case of this is a dry degraded peatland, this is a now a, a wet recovering peatland. You don't know about, if you don't know peat depth across the site to some degree and you don't know about peat quality or bulk density, and you don't know about all the other vegetation that's associated with it and how quickly it's colonized or where it's come from. And then there's the other uh, 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 effects to think about as well, because we, we talk about carbon sink, which is great. Um, and of course, they are, they are also methane emitters. Um, so it's that, it's that trade off, isn't it? That methane is, is I think, was it 24, it's 25 times more potent, but last half of that time or something, I can never remember exactly. So yes, lots of variables, exactly as we put lots of variables. I, I think you could say, Andy, that um, in the case of Carrington Moss, it would be a net emitter of carbon uh, in its current state. Would well, be. Uh, well, what's it, what's it all being used for currently? Farming, arable, most of it. Arable farming. Yeah, yes, it will yeah. be. Like I said, yeah. there was some. Yeah. Uh, that, that, yeah. If, if, if anything's to been to farm for turf, that'll be the worst, without a doubt. And anything agricultural based will be emitting because by de facto of that point it'll be drained. And if that's been drained and it's drying, that means it's oxidizing peat and therefore it will be emitting carbon without a doubt. Thank you. So yeah, bog bush crickets. So the most without box. Um and because of that point, you could uh, you could state as much as saying that it's it's rare. It is a rare species within the UK. Not rare across its range. Um, but that's because it's connected to our, to our peatland habitats. Uh, and the next one to talk about really is just uh, the white-faced darter. I say just the white-faced darter. White-faced darter dragonfly. Oh, hello. 
forgot about that. Oh, yeah, press play on this. This is a bit of rare footage. This is a, a bog bush cricket, a female. That's uh, Ovi positing within the peat right next to a bracken stem there. And this was captured by uh, one of our uh, well, one of our members of the Friends of Chatmos, uh, Dave Steele, who's a regular birder. I have to tell you that I can't get this to play. That's OK. I mean, we can see us there and it's obviously positing, but it's using the bare feet. That's OK. Not missing out too much. All it does is flex a little bit. <laughs> we'll say very <laughs> rare to be able to capture. I mean, to be able to capture that, I mean, it's, it's a tiny little thing. So he's, he's got his eye in there, but that doesn't surprise me considering it's Dave. Uh, so yeah, next I would be the white face data then, I guess. Yeah, so white face data. So that's been reintroduced to Delamere Forest a long time ago now, it's about 2013, 2014, um, down in Doolittle, I think it was. Really enough, I was volunteering on that, which is a strange little kind of full circle thing. But we've got plans to start uh, bringing that back as well to some of the Mossons within uh, the Greater Manchester wetlands. Uh, looking likely that places like Risley Moss. Risley Moss is probably the most ideal place for it right now, uh, but we're going to start getting some of our sites into the position that it needs. So creating some big deep bog pools and making sure they colonize nicely with some common cotton grass to emerge out on uh, and you know, try and improve the habitat specifically for the species because it is synonymous with a bog. It, sh it should and has historically been there. All right, and I think the next bit is just about volunteering, I think, Marge. Ooh, then. Ooh, I mentioned these already, actually. Lesser bladderwort, yeah. Fantastic carnivorous species, fastest, player, fastest species on the planet, if I recall correctly. I think it moves at one 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 hundred one one ten thousandth of a second. There's a fantastic YouTube video on it. If you just look up lesser bladderwort, it just shows you these underwater bladders just snatching up tiny little invertebrates. It's amazing. Incredible species. Has a lovely little yellow flower on top, but everything is going on underneath. All these tiny little bladders just moving at the speed of light. Brutal stuff. You won't think it to look at it, but it's absolutely killer stuff. Um, white beak sedge. That's another lovely species, quite a lot of it down around Delamere again, actually, um, around on Abbott's Moss. Again, notice to be absent from our sites. We've reintroduced it to Little Walden, as a little patch as well, and Astley. Uh, both surviving, both doing well. I like quite a bit more because it creates this lovely white flower when it's in, in bloom and when you've got a lovely uh, vista of it, it really stands out. And of course, the sundews as well. So you've got brown leaf sundew, a fairly common species, but also oblong leaved and, and greater sundew. And they kind of uh, work on a different niche. So think of like a bank and you've got a bit of water there. You'd have greater, then you'd have oblong leaved, then you'd have round leaf sundew. So all, all got specialist niches. Uh, all three of them are Astley moss now. And again, all doing very well. Really stunning thing um, when they're in flower. Very red seen flower actually as well. It's one single stem will come up with a white flower on top. I've got to get, catch it at exactly the right time. Because it was a long term volunteer who's been volunteering Astley moss for 35 years. He's never seen it flower. So that starts to show, to show how difficult it can be to pick the right times. So yeah, those are those are some of the, the plants and, and animals that we get on site and what we do to do it. And we don't do it without our volunteers, of course. We have regular sessions on Tuesdays on Little Walden and Fridays on Astley. And we might start changing the up over the next year or so to like spread out some of our other sites because we've recently purchased um, a little fragment of Mossland just north of Little Walden Moss. It's a designated SBI, uh, so it's on Greater Manchester Ecology Unit's kind of web app, if you've ever been on that. And we've called it Rindle Moss. Uh, it's, a, it's a fairly small site, just over six hectares. Um, but needs a little bit of scrub clearance, a little bit of bracken clearance, a few ditches blocks, a bit of bunding going in. And we're going to couple that alongside with um, a field to the north. And we're going to try and do a bit of a wetter farming trial um, to be confirmed exactly what yet. But the plan is that we essentially be connecting the two sites. So there's a ditch uh, that's separating them. But if you connect them, then they can be one bog mass. Uh, one can feed into the other, which would be a rather useful thing to do. Uh, so yeah, we might switch up to, to Rindle Moss, which isn't too far from Astley over the next year or so, because a lot of work. Um, yeah. And then, of course, we've got our surveys that go on throughout uh, the entire year as well. Uh, by friends of Chet Moss. So yeah, obviously, you guys are about your friends group. If you got, got any info or you want to catch up with the friends of Chatmoss, might be worth dropping them a little email or something. While we're talking about volunteers, I don't know whether David or Jeff wants to say a few words about what Trafford Wildlife does on our moss because, you know, they also rely on volunteers and and they do regular activities. So, David or Jeff, I don't know whether you want to say anything about what you guys do at this point before we move on. Um. Yeah, so we work on a number of sites um, across Carrington Moss. Um, we have um, 
uh, sort of six main uh, reserves that we work on. So we have birch moss, which is um, uh, uh, it, it's a, well, it's a kind of moss. It's, it, uh, it's on the edge of the peatland, um, and it was a bur It was originally a fir plantation, which burnt down, recolonized with birch. But then, a number of years ago, some work was done to turn it into a wetland, or, or at least a wet woodland. Um, so we do quite a lot of work on there. We've got we're we're reintroducing heather there. We're developing up. Um, a patch of heather there. We've got a number of reserves along Sindelum Brook. So we've got Brook Hayes, mm -hmm. Woods, Sindelum Green Woods, um, which we look after. Uh, we do quite a lot of work around removing invasive species uh, and looking after ponds in those woods. Uh, then we've got some, some woods further down along the Trans Pennine Trail. We've got Siemens Wood and Black Moss. Mm. Uh, which are another two reserves that we look after. Uh, so I run a Sunday group, uh, one one Sunday a, a month, um, because I work full time. I can't really devote much more than that. Uh, but Jeff Jeff um, runs a midweek group. I think roughly two, yeah. yes, yeah, two days a week. I'm running a Wednesday and Friday group on the various reserves, including white oak cover. A lot of these are National Trust uh, woodlands as the sort of uh, spe uh, sites of biological interest. Um, we're also running a Monday litter pit group, and we're also running a Saturday and Sunday balsam bashing group on various more local to sort of uh, the Trafford area in uh, West uh, Snail. Uh, one little question regarding our birch moss cover. It's probably about 50% birch at the moment, and obviously the birch, although it's been cut down to 50%, is tending to recolonize, mm. which therefore it's sucking up the water. Presumably your answer would be that even that 50% that's left really should be reduced to 10%. Uh, the reason we work to 10% is because we're technically passing the bog, or we're working towards the NBC classification of a uh, an M18 bog, I think it's classified as, which is a an Erica Tetralix Sphagnum Palustri mix. Um, NVC is very difficult because you can never fit habitats directly into these boxes that we've created. But that's the reason we pick out 10%. Um, it depends exactly what you're managing the site for, but I think as a general rule of thumb, yeah, I'd, I'd take it down to 10%. Um, I'd cut the stumps as well as we can and treat them with glyphosate if it was possible and that do its work. Okay. Um, the second question I had is, how do you repair the buns? Because if they've usually been installed using machinery, and once they're in, if you find the bun has broken somewhere or is leaking, um, you can't get the machinery back in. Is it just a, a hand replacement of the plastic sheets? Yes, it is. A, you know, it's a very difficult machinery back in once the site re wet. Um, Depends what kind of point you're up to in the restoration process. You might have different phases, but generally speaking, you're right. Uh, it'd be a hand job. And it depends what the damage is. Uh, we've had some serious issues on Little Walden with large bodies of water remaining year round, southwesterly winds kicking in, and the wave action just chopping into it until it's completely disappeared, essentially. So you're looking at, you know, a 100 metre stretch of bunding that's basically gone. So that's gone. We're not messing around with that. It's not even feasible to do it by hand. But the smaller stuff, you know, a few metres here and there, or a little leak. It can either be repacked uh, with peat, or we tend to use plastic piles because they're, well, they're going to retain water a little bit better. So you'd whack in a few plastic piles as deep as you can go, as deep as the peat is, generally speaking, and then just pile peat around the edges of it. Um, but do you have to dig out first before you can bash in the... So these plastic piles are like, uh, you literally, you, you do a patch over where the leak is of a few metres length. Yeah, you'd, you'd key it in is what we'd call it. So say your leak is, uh, say, for argument's sake, 50 metres in width. You'd probably put in piles of like 30 centimetres in width each. So you'd put in four and uh, make sure you, you you overshoot, essentially. You don't have to dig it out. It does make life easier, but it depends on the peat. If the peat's very soggy and wet underneath, it goes in like a dream. If it's compacted and horrible and desiccated and dry, it's a pain. And you also, you don't know what you're hammering into all the time. You're going to hit things like tree stumps or I've hit plywood before, don't know how I've done that. And um, it just, it's just a complete resistance. But when you're talking about smaller scale repair work, not imperative, I go mineral, do the mineral layer, you know. And also you've got a question, 
how serious is a tiny little leak? Little leaks are going to happen over time anyway. Big kind of explosions where it's built up water pressure. That's got to be done. And you've got to start asking yourself how integral is that particular bund? Um, because, like I say, it can get really hard work. So you just got to weigh up these kind of options. Okay, thank you. Andy, I was quite interested in what you said about peel and you were looking at doing some wet farming trials. What's your thoughts about the whole wet farming situation? Uh, it's a difficult one because it's not really been trialled that much uh, from, from, from our, our neck of the woods, uh, on, on our peatlands as such. Um, first thoughts when we had conversations about this was it was always kind of classic things like, oh, biofuel or, or reeds. It was like, and the sad fact is the market isn't there. So whatever wetter farming is going to look like in the future, it has to be financially viable to farmers. Now, I think on our last site visit, watercress was mentioned and I said, who cares about watercress? Is there a market for, for watercress? A farmer's going to want to come to a site and go, oh, brilliant, I can grow two hectares of watercress. I don't know. But we're looking now at things like maybe wild rice. Um, that might be a goer. Uh, I think there's some sort of um, celery as well that quite likes it wet. Part of the difficulty is we've got to not only look at something that's viable and possible, feasible, but also something that we aren't just bringing in for the heck of it. You know, we don't want to bring in something from, who knows, Japan because it grows well there. You know, that's, that's not the aim of this. It needs to be ideally something we'd naturally grow here anyway. The main sticking points is you've got to make it financially viable and you've got to make it fairly easy. Um, a lot of farmers who I interact with, you know, they've been in the business for hundreds of years, some of them, you know, this land that they've managed has been passed down generation to generation and they've got a way of working. And it's not really the most ideal thing to kind of wander into these these um, these environments and go, like, hey, look, you've been doing this for hundreds of years, do it this way. You know, there's got to be a really stepped approach to it with something robust because having looked at some of the options that are open to land managers in, in like higher level stewardship, for example, I'm not surprised that people don't go for it from a farming background. It's a myriad of, of difficult booklets to work through and, and options to kind of come together. So it's going to be a whole combination of things. We need to make sure that what's put forward is, is something that they can implement themselves. They have heavy machinery, of course, a lot of them. So it needs to be something that they can actually do, not get contractors in. Need to make it clearly financially viable, not a massive step change away from what they're doing now, and also encourage probably a, a look into. And I keep on mentioning this, or everyone keeps on mentioning elms, but it can't work as a standalone. I don't think wetter farming. You can't be here just do wetter farming. It has to be here's wetter farming coupled with your carbon capture, coupled with your biodiversity net gain potentially, coupled with elms. That that is uh, the complication really starts to come into it. So I'm hopeful that. There'll be funding for specific officers who can specialise in this to advise on this kind of natural solution kind of process or this step change in land management. It gives you that option, doesn't it, of having peat underneath and crops on the top. And I can see you want to go peat free. I think we are nearly there, aren't we? No, I think it's, it's over the last year. I think it's really, um, really uh, taken some, got some traction. Like I say, um, our suppliers weren't always peat free over the last 18 months or so. They've all changed to it if they weren't already. Uh, so I think it's a, it's a fantastic sign to be able to say, here's a here's a peatland specialist plant growing in a peat free medium. I mean, like I say, Princess Park Garden Centre in Earlham, Tom Broad, who, who runs the operation for us there, is outstanding. Yeah, he That guy knows his stuff. Been doing it 30, 35 years, and I think he gets better results than some of the, the bigger suppliers, to be honest with you, some of his plants. He's been growing cross-leaved heath in, um, he's basically got a few horses, uh, so he uses sawdust as bedding, and when he cleans it out, he keeps that and puts it on at the, at the garden centre and lets it flush out a little bit and uses it to grow cross-leaved heath in, which is um, amazing because the pH levels of that are, are neutral, which kind of baffles me a little bit. But I think it, it goes to show that sometimes it's not necessarily all about uh, the, like the pH, for example, it's just about keeping it wet and soggy. You know, fairly straightforward stuff, and it's it's getting easier to find. I think peat-free compost. I've seen it all over the place now in most of the supermarkets that I frequent. Um, but it's a difficult one to to get by. It's, we've got to take it from a local level to begin with, because where else can we start? I mean, it's, it's the only place to begin. Um, we've got to make that change ourselves and kind of enforce the suppliers to to get on board with it. Because as long as there's a market for peat compost, there'll be a market for peat compost. So I think we've reached the end of, of Andy's presentation. Are there any other questions that people have for Andy? Oh, Paul, you had a question. Yeah, yeah. Just just one. Um, I think it's recorded that in something like 1580, Chatmoss burst its banks 
and yeah. overflowed into the River Glaze and bits of it were found in the Irish Sea and so on. Are you at all concerned that it might do the same on the areas of reclamation in, in due course? Uh, definitely not in our lifetime, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but yeah, I remember hearing about it as well. It was, uh, was it Defoe? Someone wrote something about it and said it absolutely stank. But that essentially because it just, it was retaining so much water in it in its lowland dome, it just exploded. And you get a similar kind of effect now with water pressure, when I say like with the buns on a very small scale, it's essentially the same thing, water pressure builds up and builds up and the, the peat bund explodes. Um, but to see something like that happen on the sites that we're restoring, we're, we're talking about thousands, thousands of years, if ever, uh, that's mm -hmm. going to be happening. Because you think that it was, it's only recorded, like say 1580, but it's been forming for 10,000 odd years. So it could happen before that. Very doubtful though, I think. So yes, I, think I would have thought so. too much. Yeah. Yeah. And presumably on, on the buns that you've got, you've got backup buns behind them and so on. So it would have to be a catastrophic failure for anything like that to go on. Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. It'd have to be. Yeah, or some sort of horrendous kind of film style explosions all across the whole <laughs> network of bombs, you know. Uh, so no, thankfully, there's nothing integral that's been gone, that's gone. But that, when you tend to do integral or, or kind of perimeter bunding, you might use things like plygene sheeting, and that will fully reinforce it and make it super watertight. A bit more expensive, but works well. Or you can do a deep trench bund, uh, which is where you deep that, uh, dig down a lot, lot deeper and compress a lot, lot more. And that works really effectively as well. Yeah. Mm. And have you found the peat, um, the the water table goes up in the peat or? Yeah. yeah, I think that's part of the problem. I say the problem, this this next kind of stage of our restoration is probably dealing with that change. So water table is very low to begin with, you know, less than 50 centimetres uh, below the surface. But as we've been monitoring it, it's now reaching above the surface in some areas. And I think that's because the, the, the peat below the surface has been hydrated. And obviously we can't see that, we're just assuming that's happened. but. When we're getting rain now, it just raises above the, the surface so much quicker, um, yeah. which is posing uh, uh, the problem of, of retaining too much water. So that's why these coil logs are going to be very useful for the east side. Because uh, if we can colonize it with sphagnum quicker, that's not going to be an issue. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. That's interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's we'll see how it goes. We've got that's some coil logs on site now, just trialing them, but they're, they're a good little thing, actually. They're only a meter, a meter long and what, 30 centimeters deep. But they're mm. a nice little, nice little bit of kit. They, uh, they use it in the uplands a lot to block up the gullies. Um, we haven't yeah. used them on the lowlands yet, but I think they, they're going to serve a good purpose. Well, I've used them around pond edges and things like that, and they're already pre-seeded um, with, with plants. So, I mean, presumably you could do the same um, for the mosslands. You could you yeah. could put other species in. Absolutely, you could, yeah. Good idea. So, Leslie, I think you had a question. The, the original Stevenson's railway line that ran across from Liverpool to Manchester, uh, is that well above the level of the, of the moss now, or, or has, has it fallen with the moss? Typical to know exactly, uh, because there's, there's little remnant bits of kind of steel sticking out the ground on Cadizet moss. So I'd say there's areas where the, tr the train line will have naturally remained higher. Uh, than the extracted areas, they would almost like our, they would say our pre-existing tracks in and out the site, but those raised areas are, are, are still going to be higher than the extracted peat areas. So even the restored areas will be lower than those pre-existing kind of track lines. Mm -hmm. uh, take a long time to to restore the site to a point where it's going to be accumulating peat uh, at a, at any kind of level at all. I mean, the general rule of thumb is or general statement is. A pristine bog will accumulate peat at one millimetre a year. We're not even close to pristine. We're in a good condition, decent, okay, but certainly not pristine. Uh, so it'll take a fair amount of time before we're going to reach the levels of, of the pre-existing kind of train track that runs through the, the site. Well, thank you. I think I think tradition had it that uh, Stevenson built that track using cotton bales and effectively floated the mm. track across the saturated parts of the moss. That's right. It's quite, in, quite inventive and ingenious, really, to be fair. I mean, ecologically horrendous, but from an industrial kind of standpoint and what was needed at the time, I've got to say, clever bloke is William Roscoe. But it's beyond that, there's a main trail. And then, of course, there's got all the, the individual tracks running up and down where the actual like hand balling of peat extraction was going on across the sites as well. So there's a whole network of stuff going on there. Massive, massive, uh, massive effort. Mm. Incredible. 
So can I just ask Andy, is there an area limit so that you can do for restoring peat moss? You know, is any place too small or too big or, you know, so what sort of, what's your sort of um, ideal size of area for peatland restoration? It's difficult. I mean, it's all dependent on funding and uh, if, you, if you've got the, the staff to kind of to, to manage it, essentially. Um, I don't think there's anywhere too small. Uh, like I said, Pest Furling Moss is a little fragment in, in Birchwood, uh, so managed by um, the Woodland Trust. Uh, God, I had a mind blank then. And that's like 0.45 of a hectare. So very, very small. But there's no, definitely not any site too small because you can do very, very low maintenance, fairly low impact restoration works to begin with. For example, put a three ditch blocks in an area and that will soon start retaining water. And that's essentially what's happened across the site we just bought, the old SBI, now called Rindle Moss. Natural England went in there and put in a handful of blocks. It's done all right. We can do more and it will, it will have an effect much quicker. But there's certainly not any area where we'd limit ourselves saying there's anywhere too small. In terms of anywhere too big, again, I don't want to limit ourselves so there's nowhere, nowhere too big. But that is all dependent on funding. There's uh, I'd probably say a little caveat would be it's a dangerous kind of precedent to set that you'd go and try and restore a site without having the funding or staffing capacity to fulfill the needs of the site. The last thing you want to do is go and then do half a job and then it'd be forgotten about. And then 10 years later, someone walks in and goes, what the heck happened here? Why didn't you do the full job? Why is there still bare peat lying around here? So it's very, very funding dependent, I'd say. Yeah. Any other questions for Andy? I think we may be coming back to you, Andy, as we take our project forward. But uh, that's been so interesting. Um, I'm yes, sure everybody good. will agree. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, um, like I say, I had the guys out from Lindo Most. Yeah. John and Pauline. I'm going to stop trying to guess names. But I was just like a little go around little woman just to show what we've done and how it's worked. It's just to give people ideas, really, because it's about knowledge sharing at the end of the day, isn't it? You know, yes, lot of people are trying to work towards similar goals, and it's just good to get some ideas and see how well it works and, and get some inspiration, I think. Anyway, that's been fabulous. I really yeah. appreciate it, Andy. Yeah, thank you. Any questions you got, fire them away. Absolutely. And don't forget, I mean, um, it's great to restore peatlands, but even if it's not restorable to a peatland, it could still be restored to some sort of wetlands, whether it be a transitional kind of habitat, like some sort of lag fen or even just a pen. Still got value. So. And good point. Print. Very good point. Oh. Okay. Thank you, everyone.